theology of women in ministry. She's also the author of numerous published articles and has served globally through conferences and theological institutions in 13 countries. Denise is committed to equipping leaders to serve in ministries with children and youth as the crucial mission field of our time. And she is passionate about partnering with parents and spiritual formation of their children. Um, I know that I'm not the only one who has sat under Denise as she taught. You must have started around age five when you yes. started teaching yes. seminary. Um, she and her wife, her husband, Alan, have been uh, not only great mentors for so many people, but I consider them to be friends. And so if you get a chance to interact with them, I would strongly encourage you to do so. So we are ready to break now. Those with red and blue lanyards go downstairs. And what, I don't even know what the other colors are. If you don't have one of those colors, you stay up here uh, for the first hour. Alan is handing out uh, handouts just to kind of encourage, help you track with what I have to share today. I'm just delighted to be able to be here with you. I was so appreciative of Randy uh, connecting with me and offering me the opportunity to come and share about something that is a passion of mine, um, how family can be at the foundation of spiritual formation. One thing that we all have in common is we all came from a family and we all are a part of a family. We might be a family of one as a single person. We might be a part of an extended family. We might be a, a two-parent family, a single-parent family, a blended family, all kinds of different families, but we all have that in common. So I thought I'd show you my family. It's always nice to kind of know who you're talking to. There we are. Um, this is our crew. My husband, Alan, we've been partners in ministry and marriage for for over 40 years. Uh, once again, I think we were married when we were five, so um, child bride right here. Next to Alan uh, is our daughter Emily's family. Emily is a high school teacher in St. Paul, Minnesota in an urban core school. She has a passion to bring um, educational equity to children and youth, and she's taught ninth grade math, algebra, and geometry is her favorite. And this year she's doing math coaching and also heading up the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts of their school. Next to her is her husband, Ryan. He works for a nonprofit called Prepare and Pop Prosper in the Twin Cities, which is all about bringing economic justice and utilizing tax preparation as a portal of entry into people's lives who um, can use some coaching in order to move towards economic justice. They built their family through adoption so they adopted siblings, Kiki and Kivan, from North Minneapolis. So they just came across the, the, the river. And um, it has been an incredibly transformational journey for us to walk this journey of adoption with these amazingly resilient uh, young people. Kiki is turning 21 next week. And actually, this is kind of crazy. There's, it's been a, anytime you adopt children at the age of 14 and nine, that's how old they were when they were adopted. It's when they became available for adoption. Um, you can imagine there was a lot of trauma that led to that place in their life where they were available for adoption. And so it's an up and down journey when you adopt children from the foster care system. But we are at a really good um, moment or chapter. And Kiki is turning 21 April 3rd and she's invited her grandparents, her parents and her little brother to come to Spearfish, South Dakota where she lives, Sundance, Wyoming. She lives in Sundance, works in Spearfish and celebrate her 21st birthday with her. Like, that's a win, that's a big win. So we're heading west on Saturday with our family and are gonna celebrate Kiki's birthday. Uh, Kivan is turning 16 
that means a driver's ed, a job, all these kinds of things. He has this wonderfully inquisitive mind. He's interested in things like rock polishing and glass blowing and forging, just all kinds of interesting kinds of things. So we're looking forward to spending um, actually a spring break trip with him. We'll go on to Garden of the Gods because he likes rocks and so we're going to go look at rocks in Colorado and hike around them and pick up a lot of them, no doubt. Next to me is our son, Jordan. He's a United Methodist pastor in the Dakotas, serves a couple of congregations. He also serves at Sioux Falls Seminary as a faculty mentor, and he also teaches course of study teaches at Garrett, or course of study for pastors at Garrett Theological Seminary. His wife, Faith, is from um, Pennsylvania and worked at Messiah College for a long time in international students um, ministries, or uh, it's more like student life, international students with international and first generation college students, and they've moved to Sioux Falls, and we love that because we have two littles, we call them, nearby. Um, right now, Hazel, I mean, sorry, Faith works for the Avera um, Health System and does leadership <laughs> development and is moving more into diversity, equity, and inclusion work, as well as formation. And then Hazel turned six and is a kindergartner and just loving kindergarten. And her world is expanding and we get to celebrate her numbers and her letters and all the good things. She's a, she is an energetic child who's going to change the world. Um, and her little brother Henry, who will turn four this month. If Hazel's going to change the world, Henry's going to love the world. So there are these wonderfully diverse personalities and we get to enjoy them a great deal. So that's a little bit about my family. I've shown you a picture of them, but there are lots of words we can use to describe family. So when I say family is, what do you think of? Let's call out some things that family is. Community. Love. Connections. Identity. Complicated. Now we're getting real. A journey. Acceptance. Support. Genetically connected to for better or worse. And then someone else was saying something. Chaos. Heritage. Yeah. Chosen. Good. There are all kinds of ways that we, pardon me? It's an organism. Yes, yes. There are many ways we can complete that sentence of family is. I thought maybe it'd be fun to look at a few pictures of what family looks like. Sometimes families include four-footed friends who make it into our Christmas uh, pictures. Families are places where accidents can happen. Oops. <laughs> and evidently families are places where people really like plaids. We got plaids, we've got plaids, families and plaids. Lots and lots of plaids. Families can be people who we like to do silly things with. I think this is a church basement somewhere. I'm not sure. <laughs> but there's some kind of an Easter activity going on there, I'm thinking. <laughs> Families are, are people with whom we can eat ice cream cones and giggle together as some goes in our tummies and some goes on our noses. Uh, families include grandmothers and their grandchildren. Families, indeed, are multi-generational. Um, Families are places where love is experienced. Families can have many children or one child. Families come in all cultures and all contexts. They come in every um, racial and ethnic group. Families are a part of uh, sometimes single parents, single dads with children, sometimes a single mom with children. But regardless of what families look like, the goal would be that we all run together in the same direction into the light of discipleship, that we can together uh, be spiritually formed by, we join, by how we join together as families. I love this quote. Oopsie, I hit the black. There we go. There are no real, or no ideal families, only real families. There are no ideal families, only real families. A couple of you went, hmm. And actually, I was quite surprised about how positive you were about families in your descriptors, because sometimes I get things like messy and challenging and hard and painful and difficult. We hear all those words related to family as well. So if you think about families in the Bible, they were far from ideal, far from ideal, right? 
Uh, so let's think about what kinds of things were going on in families in the Bible. Call out some things that were happening in families in the Bible. Conflict, sibling rivalry, favoritism, jealousy, deception, birthrights. Say it again. Division. Betrayal. Murder. It happened with the very first family. Yes. Reconciliation. Worship. Love. Passing on faith from one generation to the next. But there's a whole lot of mess in biblical families. <laughs> a whole lot of mess. I taught a family ministry class just this last week at Bethel Seminary. We do intensives. And one of the students, after we did kind of this overview of biblical families, he said, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, like, what's the example of the biblical family that I want to model my family after? Is there one? And I think the reality is uh, what we learn is that I love that about the Bible, that it's honest and it's true and it's raw. And here's the good news. Um, God worked in and through all those families to bring about his purpose. There is no family, no family, no family that is outside the realm of his love. There is no family through which he cannot work. There is no family through which discipleship cannot happen within the lives of those family members, regardless of what they're facing, regardless of what, they're, what they look like, regardless of the level of dysfunction. God is at work and willing and able to work through all kinds of families to bring about his purposes. God works through real families. Sometimes people say to me, um, I, I want a biblical family. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> do you really? <laughs> you might want to think about that. Which one of those do you want? Um, and in spite of all that, God works. God works. So there are no real families, uh, ideal families, only real families. I love this quote by Don, uh, Ron Hunter, rather. He says, the family is not always an ideal set of parents and kids all doing what God intended. Does that sound about right? It's not always that. But regardless of your season in life, God can use you to teach someone in your family, and I love the fact that he expands it, or your sphere of influence by way of friendship and connection. So it might be your family or it might be your chosen family, as someone noted, that we can be about God's work in each other's lives in amazing and powerful ways. So let's talk about what families look like in scripture. All the families don't look the same, and Ron Hunter goes on to give us four types of families, which I think is helpful for us to think about. He says they're the intended family, what God intended in creation. And he gives the example of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we know in those families there was some messiness too. But what happened in that family was a generational passing on a faith from one generation to the next. So that was the intent, passing on faith, living in community with each other, one generation to the next. But then there's the adapted family, and he gives the example of Mordecai and Esther. When Esther was taken into the king's harem to become the next queen, she learned of this plot to kill her people, and what does she do? She goes to her family, she goes to Uncle Mordecai to say, this is going on. We've got to do something. And this young woman, who was far from a beauty queen, became, uh, only, <laughs> became the savior of her people. And she and her uncle together were a part of this process. She was the one with the bravery and the courage who went into the king's court. But she turned to her family to ask, what is my role? And his response, maybe the Lord, maybe God has brought you to this place for such a time as this. And you have a role to play of saving your people. There are one-parent families or single-parent families. Uh, Don, Ron Hunter talks about Eunice and Timothy as kind of a spiritual single-parent family. So there was likely a Greek father, but he was not a part of the faith. So faith was being passed on in a single-parent family kind of way. But I also think of Hagar and Ishmael, and Hagar being sent out into the desert and readying herself to die and coming to the place where there's an interaction with God and she names God 
She's the first person who names God, and she names him Elroy, the God who sees. A single parent family where God had not abandoned them, and God saw them. And then adoptive families. We can think of this in terms of spiritual adoption, like Paul and Titus, but also guardianship, like Pharaoh's daughter and Moses, where this adoptive relationship was present. So not all families in the Bible looked the same. And today, not all families look the same. Today, we might have uh, the intended family, parents with children, dad and mom, son and daughter. That was the intent from creation. And then we, about 70% of children today live in homes with um, two parents. That includes blended families. So it may not be their birth parent, but 70, just a little less than 70% of children live in homes with two parents. Then we move to the adaptive family. A rising number of grandparents are raising their grandchildren. About 5% of children live in this type of home. And it might be aunties and uncles taking care of a little one for a season where mom or mom and dad can't do so. So they're an adapted family. Then single parent families, where it can be a mom or a dad with a child. And this along with blended families is the fastest rising number of types of families in our country today. Blended and single parent families. A full 25% of children live in single parent family homes today. And then adopted families. Children who maybe come to your congregation through a faith friend. Their parents don't come to church, but they come. So they're spiritually adopted into your community of faith. Or might literally be adoptive children who are in need of a family. And as I mentioned, our family has been enriched and transformed over the last six years as we've become family together with Kiki and Kivan. So I want you to think for a minute about the families in your community. Turn to a couple people around you. And give a few examples, put some flesh on these structures. Uh, what does your congregation look like in terms of intended family, adopted family, single parent family, or adoptive families? And I'll give you about three minutes or so. Yes, sir. That's a question. Where would you place um, multi-generational families? That's, in yes. Mm -hmm. That's another model of family. Let's include that. Thank you. A multi-generational family. I mentioned our daughter teaches in St. Paul. Um, her school is uh, largely Karen and Hmong, and they live multi-generationally. So it's very, very common for there to be a grandma and a grandpa or one or the other parents and children all in the same household. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Appreciate that. So turn to each other and talk about the families in your churches. How do they fit into these different models? I'll give you about three minutes or so to do that.
All right, if you can wrap up that conversation. All right, let's pull back together, if we could, please. We'll give you a chance to talk to each other again in a little bit. It's good for us just to pause and think about what kinds of families we're serving, what kinds of families we see in our churches, and then to be reminded that child discipleship, and I would say spiritual formation as a whole, can happen in all models of family. And here's the deal, folks. This is really important because on average, a regular church attender today will be at church 1.7 times a month. So even if they came every week, we might have one or two hours a week with children and youth. At best, three hours a week if they're really faithful. And every week there are 168 hours. We get them for one or two or maybe three hours. And those are really powerful hours. I'm not um, in any way saying that that's not important. But if we hang all of child discipleship, if we hang all of spiritual formation on what we do in the church, we're missing something. So we need to figure out how to partner well with parents and, the, and grandparents and faith friends and guardians. So I have very intentionally broadened that beyond parents to include grandparents. Um, faith friends who bring the kids to church with them, bring the young person to youth group with them, and guardians who might be in a temporary place of caring for a child. We need to partner with them if we want to see spiritual formation happen. And here's the deal. I think over the course of the last many years, the pendulum keeps swinging back and forth between church-centered um, Christian education and home-centered ed Christian education. And kind of every new generation thinks, oh, we're going to equip parents and we're going to do this amazingly well. And I can trace the pendulum swinging back and forth. And in some ways, it's kind of like a plumb line where the, the ball starts circling wider and wider and wider. And more people are having this conversation than ever before. But I also know that it can get discouraging. We just came through, or maybe we're still in, the pandemic. And if ever there was a time where parents could have stepped up and invested in the spiritual formation of their children, this would have been it, right? Like this could have been our like, yay, we, we've equipped them and they know how to do it and, and they're living faith together and it's on them in a whole new way. Because I know I have students who, uh, and graduates who put out these amazing resources for parents who initially were watching them with their kids and then they saw the numbers start dropping off. And I'm I'm not being hard on parents because the pandemic was hard on everybody, but it didn't happen in the ways we would have wished for and liked it to happen. And parents are like, oh, I'm so glad I can bring my kids back to church. I'm so glad I can bring my youth back to youth group because um, I can't do this by myself. I can't do it alone. That is very true. And we need to figure out a way that we can partner well with them. So I'm an educator, so I'm gonna share with you three types of education and three types of curriculum that I think will help you provide a partnership with the home in spiritual formation that can balance uh, what happens in the home and really encourage people in their process, uh, moving from one area to the next. So, three types of education. There's formal education, informal education, and non-formal education. You've probably heard of formal and informal, oh, I'm sorry, formal, informal, oh, it's supposed to be non-formal. I mistyped that, change that, please. It shouldn't be null. It's null curriculum, it's non-formal. So formal, and actually the order should be, I apologize, the order should be formal, then non-formal, then informal. So formal education, what does that look like? We think of that as the public school, the private school, homeschooling, it's where there's an outside accrediting body that in some way credentials the educational experience. So we know what that looks like, right? 
Non-formal education is probably a little less familiar to you, but that's what we do in the church. So there is a plan, there's a curriculum, there's something that we're doing together, but nobody gives like a, a credentialing after a second grader finishes that year of Sunday school, right? Um, so it's, it's a non-formal education in that it, it has a plan, it usually has a curriculum, but there's no outside accrediting body. So Sunday school, children's church, midweek children's clubs, small groups, youth group, all those things are part of non-formal education. And then there's informal education. That's socialization. That's life on life, uh, sharing life together. And here's the deal, for, and that's where the family's really good. The family's really good at informal. And what's happened is sometimes we try and place the way the church does Christian formation on the family in their context. And they can do it for a while, but it's really not the way they're structured. They're structured for informal education. But it's a lot harder to program informal education. It's a lot harder to resource it in terms of curriculum. And what is needed in informal education is an integrated life of faith. An integrated life of faith. Um, informal education really is the way that Jesus educated. Jesus called his disciples to come and be with him. That's informal education. Now, did he have times of teaching? Absolutely. Absolutely. Did they spend time in the synagogue? Yes, they did. Uh, but the core of how he discipled his followers was through informal education. So if we want to follow in the way of Jesus, if we want our homes to follow in the way of Jesus, we need to capture informal education. And that's in the comings and goings of life. So what does that look like? How do we do that? Well, I think looking at curriculum can help us understand this a bit. There are three approaches to curriculum. There's explicit curriculum. That's the resources and the materials that we put in people's hands when they are teaching uh, on behalf of our Christian education of our church. But then there's implicit curriculum. If I asked you about your Sunday school teachers, your youth group leaders, would you tell me about the best lesson they ever taught you? No, you wouldn't. You would tell me about the person they were. Like I remember Mrs. Stanky was her name. It's kind of a horrible name, but anyway, Mrs. Stanky, um, a German name, Steinke is how it should have been pronounced. She taught me the books of the Bible in third and fourth grade, and I remember that process. But what I remember even more than that is I remember that Mrs. Stanky cared about me. And I remember Mrs. Bauer, who would have us come over to her house, and we would play games together, we would bake cookies together, we would go on outings together. She developed a relationship with me. I don't remember any lessons she taught. That doesn't mean the lessons weren't important. They became the explicit curriculum upon which to hang the implicit curriculum. But what good is explicit curriculum without the implicit curriculum of relationship, context? Culture is really important in family. How we live out our families is very much connected to the culture we are a part of. So implicit curriculum is absolutely critical. And then there's this area of curriculum that we often don't talk about, but it's called null curriculum. Null curriculum means what you don't teach about teaches a great deal. What you don't talk about, what you don't teach about teaches a great deal. So for instance, the church has been notorious for not doing a good job of talking about certain things. Like, I'm glad we're talking about politics today. Um, I know that's a dicey thing, but when we don't talk about it, it, it teaches something, doesn't it? Churches typically don't talk about sexuality. When we don't talk about sexuality, that teaches something. Families often don't talk about sex either. They also don't talk about finances. That teaches something. And what we're finding is a lot of families don't talk about faith. So it becomes a null curriculum. And when a family doesn't talk about faith, what are they teaching their children? It's not important. It belongs at church. It's a very segmented view of the world, not an integrated view of the world and of our faith and how we live our lives. So when families don't talk about faith, they are teaching something very, very powerful in that process. 
So let's talk about what explicit curriculum might look like in uh, spiritual formation in the home. So we do things like we read our Bibles together, or we read Bible stories to children when they're young. We utilize devotional materials that might be available to us. We have Christian books available, and we read Christian books to little ones, and maybe we read books together as children grow older and discuss them together. We might have Christian music woven through our, our days as we spend life and time together. It doesn't always have to be Christian music, but maybe some Christian music that intersperses in the midst of the music that is a part of what's being played in the family. This is not something which is optional. Psalm 78 makes it very, very clear. Let me read these verses for you. Psalm 78, 1 through 8. O my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from the past. Stories we have heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. Then here it comes. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them. And even the children not yet born from generation to generation. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. This is not an optional activity for us as families. We are commanded to pass on faith to the next generation. And what that looked like in my family when I was growing up, at our family dinner time, we would start with prayer and we would end with family devotions. And I remember becoming old enough to be able to read the Bible verse or to be able to read the devotional material. And then we would spend time in prayer together. My mom was a Sunday school teacher and a good news club leader, and she practiced her lessons on me. So it was brought into the home. And in fact, as a result of one of those lessons, I was prompted by the Spirit to uh, kneel at my mother's bedside and to accept Jesus as my Savior. As we uh, grew our family, in our family, we asked our children to walk us through their day. And essentially, we ask them to do the practice of examen. Like, let's look back and see where did you sense the presence of God and where did you sense the absence of God? We didn't use that language, but that's what we were doing as we talked about blessings and bummers in our day. And the blessings were things that we could give thanks for and the bummers were things that we could bring to prayer. Our, our daughter continued that tra tradition in her family as she had older kids and they would, she would say, tell us three things about your day. You have the choice to share whether they're blessings or bummers. But three things about your day. Our home, when the kids were growing up, were filled with Christian books. We regularly listened to Christian music. All of those things were part of the explicit curriculum of spiritual formation in our home. And we partnered with our church by taking our kids to church and being involved in the discipleship processes that were present there. So explicit curriculum is important, but it's not enough. And if we just place it on parents, like if you just do all of that, then it will be okay. Maybe, maybe not. Because if they don't have the implicit curriculum piece, um, where they are mindful of the family culture, the family context, the family relationships, and intentionality that is brought to bear in that. So ex implicit culture um, uh, curriculum, rather, includes all those things. Understanding our family culture as African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinx families, Euro Americans, Native Americans, culture impacts how we experience family and how we do spiritual formation in the home. And then where we live, whether it's in Beatrice, <laughs> Nebraska, or whether it's in an urban context, a suburban context, a rural context, a small town, we're part of the prairies, so that impacts how we do faith together. And then family relationships. Relationships are the net. They're really the net that hold the spiritual formation process in the home. It's the conduit through which a child experiences spiritual formation. And so healthy, strong relationships are better suited to spiritual formation and discipleship. Then intentionality. We must bring a level of awareness um, to our our processing of spiritual formation. 
whether we're a parent, a grandparent, a guardian, or a faith friend. If we can harness that intentionality, it will make a big difference. I just heard someone recently say that um, she would read her Bible off her phone in a public place where her children would see her, and then she realized they don't need, know I'm reading my Bible. They might think I'm looking at Facebook or checking out Instagram, and she wanted to make sure her children saw her reading her Bible intentionally. She wanted them to experience that in their home, so she got out a, a hardcover paper copy of her Bible and stopped reading her Bible on her phone because that wasn't creating what she intended in that sense. I remember seeing my dad reading his Bible and preparing for his Sunday school lesson every Saturday night. Do our children see us reading our Bibles? And then harnessing teachable moments. Uh, teachable moments come all day, every day. Recently, we were at our family cabin, and Henry and I are early risers, so we were walking up the hill, and the sun was rising, and he looked to the east and he said, Hi, son. Good morning, God. And I thought, oh, teachable moment. Here we go. So I shared with him Lamentations 324, how God's mercies are new every morning and God is faithful and that God walks with us from sunrise to sunset. And we said, thank you, God. And that's it. That was less than 30 seconds, but woven through the day, teachable moments. And here's, here's the struggle. If we are not filled up with faith, when children bump into us, and they will, what can spill out is impatience and anger and weariness and frustration. But if, and that happens, right? That's part of family life. But if we are so filled up with faith, if we are so filled up with the fruit of the Spirit, what spills out can be love, joy, peace, patience. So really a call to see faith formation happening in the home is a call to build adult disciples so that they're so filled up with faith that it naturally integrates into their life and their conversation with their children and their young people. This is what was intended in Deuteronomy 6 in the Shema. Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands, wear them on your forehead as reminders, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So whether you're in or out, up or down, private or public, faith should be so integrated into our lives that it just spills out of us. Then that null curriculum that I mentioned um, <clears throat> is present as well, and we need to ask ourselves, that question, what spills out. But the null curriculum, if we never speak about faith at home with our children, what does our lack of communication teach them about their faith? And I think we've talked about that in wonderful ways. So I want to share with you four keys that can make a difference in child discipleship, in spiritual formation in the home, and all of us are formed in the home. This comes from Dr. David Anderson and the Youth and Family Institute in the Twin Cities. And he said, if you could integrate these four things into a family, you would see faith formation happening. So caring conversations, family devotions, family rituals and traditions, and family in service. Those are the four keys. So caring conversations. These are simple faith conversations with mother, simple faith conversations with father. That was the number one and number two factor in terms of what made faith stick in the life of a young adult when they left home. Faith conversations with mother, faith conversations with father. That's integrated faith. Just in the comings and goings of life, it's the conversations that make a big difference. Then family devotions, an intentional time of reading the Bible together, praying together, worshiping together. That has a place. That has a place in our families, and we need to encourage and equip and empower our families to gather together around the word, to gather together in prayer, to worship together, family devotions. And then family traditions. Um, it might be something like how we celebrate holidays. When I was growing up, our, our family opened presents on Christmas morning, but we never opened presents before my dad in his green chair read from the King James Bible um, the Christmas story. And that we have continued that tradition in our family. And sometimes I read from my dad's King James Bible and we read the Christmas story together and are reminded that the most important gift 
is the gift of Jesus coming. So those traditions, it could be having donuts on Saturday morning and having conversations together about it. And then family and service, looking outside ourselves, serving together, partnering together with our children in our church, partnering in our community, um, serving together. We do something at the church that we're a part of where we partner with Feeding South Dakota, and once a month we distribute f food in our parking lot in partnership with them. And children can come and be a part of that. We partner with the Salvation Army and we serve Sally's table and kids can come and be a part of that. Maybe it's something where someone in your neighborhood has lost a loved one, so you, you bake something and you take it to them and in that process of serving, you have your conversation with your children or the young people in your home about, we do this because Jesus came to serve and we want to live out this call to service. Well, there are, uh, there is further evidence that these things are important. A little more recent research from Barna. Um, he said that there are uh, three elements that are part of, of a household, um, spiritually vibrant household. Number one, you can't really see that there. Number one is, let me try, nope. Hmm, okay, I apologize for that, but you have it on your handout. The number one factor in spiritually vibrant households is spiritual practices. So family devotions, prayer, Bible reading. The number two thing that he found was spiritual conversation. Sounds familiar, right? And then he became more specific and said hospitality, opening our homes to others, welcoming others into our family. We did this a lot when our kids were growing up. It might be for a, a meal or it might be for up to three years the family lived with us. So we had people live with us our whole life and when our kids were little. Um, it could be singles, college age students, even a family of four lived with us for a year. Um, it helped us integrate faith into everyday life as we welcomed others into our families. So re research has told us that if we want faith to stick, if we want to make faith something that continues, we can actually double the likelihood of child dis discipleship sticking into adulthood if we do these four things. Caring conversations, family devotions, family uh, rituals and traditions, and family and service which is amazing when you think about it. Uh, then Barna re-emphasizing spiritual practices, spiritual conversations. So those things included along with hospitality can be transformational in terms of sharing faith with others. Well, I, it's our time is slipping away. Do I go just to 10.50? Is that the plan, Randy? Okay, so I want to just conclude and I'll hang out and we can chat a little bit as well, but I hope that you remember that the church is the only institution that sees the whole family and walks with them over years. So we are uniquely poised to care for families. And I hope you're encouraged to celebrate all families. Uh, a, a elementary school that we partner with has a big sign that says, we love you and there's nothing you can do about it. I think we should have that on our churches as families walk in. We love you, God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Provide hope for families. God can and will work through every type of family. And then develop a partnership, an encouraging, empowering partnership with the home. We can harness informal education, uh, encourage people to integrate faith into life. We can provide resources for the explicit curriculum of faith formation. We can help them strengthen their relationships as a family. The whole thing of connect before you correct. I mean, that's something that's foundational in terms of relationships and families. And we can encourage families to serve together and to be hospitable for, with others. And as we do so, we will find that faith formation is foundational in the home in partnership with the church. Thank you for your time and your thoughts. Um, I can hang around for as long as you'd like, uh, but I think you guys are supposed to head downstairs in a few minutes. So is there one, one question, two questions you want to ask real quick before we go? Comment. All right. Oh, go ahead. Go be you. Go be you. There you go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Go ahead and um, take a break and then head downstairs at 11 if you would. Thank you.